Welcome back to Crux Stationalis, the Roman Station Church Network. Today, for Gaudete Sunday, we head to the Roman Station Church of the Papal Basilica of St. Peter's. The Roman Station Church pilgrimage is a long-lasting tradition, nearly as old as the legalization of Christianity itself. We can say the breadth of its pilgrimage is synonymous with the rising of the walls of the seemingly countless basilicas in Rome. I first came to Rome in 2009 and subsequently in 2011 to study and discern my vocation, and I have lived in Rome since 2015. The Roman station churches and my love for them is my claim at Crux Stationalis to being some part Roman and fitting in among the locals. Do as the Romans do, as we like to say. I'm glad you are here for the journey. Don't forget to subscribe now to our channel by hitting that red subscribe button, and we already know you're going to like this video. I mean, let's be honest with ourselves. We are going to St. Peter's Basilica. Give the video a like, and when you are done watching, share this video with your family and friends. To arrive to St. Peter's, we cross the Bridge of the Angels, Ponte degli Angeli, walking towards Castel San Angelo. The choice of station for Gaudete Sunday may seem rather counterintuitive. On the only Sunday of Advent, whose introit, or entrance antiphon, is taken from the epistles of St. Paul, we might expect the station to be kept at the church which guards his tomb, St. Paul's Outside the Walls. Instead, the station is kept at St. Peter's. St. Peter's is the original Roman station church for the principal mass on Christmas Day. As the Church of Rome proclaims today, Gaudete Dei, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your modesty be known to all men, for the Lord is nigh. She anticipates the joy of the Savior's birth in the same place where his birth will be most solemnly celebrated in two weeks' time with the Holy Father on Christmas Day. In a certain sense, however, the Basilica of St. Peter in the Vatican is also dedicated to St. Paul. The Liturgy of Rome always remembers the two apostles together, not only in their joint feasts on June 29th, but also by adding to feasts such as that of Peter's chains or the conversion of Paul, a commemoration of the other apostolic founder of the church in the Eternal City. This tradition was reflected in the art of the old St. Peter's Basilica, in which nearly every image of St. Peter was accompanied by one of St. Paul. In the modern basilica, on the other hand, there are many images of its titular saint, but hardly any of St. Paul. Its decorative program conceived in the Counter-Reformation answers the Protestant rejection of the Pope's authority by laying much greater emphasis on Peter alone. In this video, we will look a little bit more to the liturgy itself of today, and then we will explore some of the history of the old St. Peter's Basilica, leaving way for future videos here at Crux Stationalis to explore St. Peter's Basilica as it stands today. In the traditional Roman breviary, the ninth responsory of this Sunday's Matins, taken from the beginning of the second chapter of Isaiah, may also be an oblique reference to the station at St. Peter's Basilica. The Lord will teach us his ways, and we will walk in his paths. For the law shall come forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. Come, let us go to the mountain, ad montem, of the Lord, and to the house of the God of Jacob. The modern buildings around St. Peter's and the massive new basilica itself largely hide the fact that the Vatican is really a hill. In antiquity, the hills in and around Rome were usually called Mons, mountain, rather than Colis, hill. The ways and paths may be a reference to the three ancient roads, Cornelia, Aurelia Nova, and Triumphalis, which ran close to the place of St. Peter's death in the Circus of Nero and the nearby Vatican necropolis where he was buried. The Lord will teach us and the law will come forth, would then refer to St. Peter's God-given role as the first pope and teacher of the apostolic faith. Here is a section of the Forma Orbis Rome by Rorofo Lanciani, produced at the end of the 19th century. 
It shows the ancient Basilica of St. Peter in black and its conjectured relationship to ancient constructions nearby. The Circus of Nero, where St. Peter was crucified, is shown on the south side of the Basilica. Its precise size and location are unknown. Modern structures, including the current Basilica, are shown in red. And we see the pathways of Cornelia, Aurelia Nova, and Triumphalis running close to the place of St. Peter's death. The largest and perhaps most impressive basilica in the world rises over the pagan cemetery that extended from the Via Cornelia, the road that connected the Tiber to the Via Aurelia, and flanked Nero's circus. Now we approach St. Peter's atop centuries of Roman dust and stone as one would have walked towards the circus of Nero along the Via Cornelia. From Castel San Angelo to St. Peter's, we traverse that similar path. It was exactly at the Circus of Nero that around 67 AD, during the first persecution of Christians launched by Nero, that the Apostle Peter was crucified during a spectacle that included battles between slaves, gladiators, and wild beasts. The Christians immediately took Peter's body and buried it in the cemetery near the circus. The remains of that cemetery can still be seen today beneath the basilica in that famous Scavi tour. Excavations between 1939 and 1950 unearth both the tomb and the relics of the apostle. Pope Anacletus, pope from the year 76 to the year 88, built a small chapel over the apostle's tomb. It immediately became a place of worship and pilgrimage for the early Christians, later for popes and those who would come to Rome in spite of the risks of the ferocious persecutions, so that they could pray at the tomb of the Prince of the Apostles. The persecutions came to an end under Constantine, the emperor who had a vision of the cross as a sign of victory. Under his reign, the church's spiritual leadership was officially recognized with the famous Edict of Milan in 313. It was Constantine who, in 324, built a lavish basilica over the entire cemetery and part of the Circus of Nero. The main altar was to stand over Peter's simple tomb. Legend tells us that the emperor removed his rich robes and began digging the foundations with his own hands. He personally filled and carried away 12 baskets of earth, one for each apostle. The circus had to be destroyed to build the church, and many tombs had to be removed and reburied. According to Roman law, only the emperor, the supreme authority, could give permission to tamper with grave sites. Then, to position the main altar over St. Peter's tomb, half the hillside sloping down towards the circus had to be excavated. The cuts in the hill are still visible to this day on the northern side outside the basilica. The old five-aisled basilica was 118 meters long, 64 meters wide, and had 88 columns, that is 22 in each row. Construction of the basilica began in 324. The main portion was finished in just five years and was consecrated by Pope St. Sylvester, who reigned from 314 to 335. Over the following decades, it was embellished with a portico that soon became a preferred burial place for popes, kings, and emperors who wanted their final resting places near that of St. Peter. During previous centuries, many simple faithful had been buried there as well, giving further proof of the authenticity of the legend that this is indeed the site of St. Peter's tomb. Later, a bell tower with 12 windows on each of its six stories was built as was a double portico that was used for papal blessings. The ancient basilica had 120 altars, 27 of which were in some way dedicated to the Virgin Mary. Of the 700 oil lamps, 120 burned around St. Peter's tomb. The basilica was a focal point for spiritual life. Peter and other early Christians were martyred on the site, and Peter was buried here. Peter's successors chose the site as emblematic of the papacy to be near to St. Peter, the very first pope. And it was here that relics from the Holy Land, such as the relic of the Holy Cross, St. Veronica's veil, and the lance that had pierced the side of Christ have been kept. 
The interior of the basilica was resplendent, with rare marbles, mosaics of all colors, shining metals, draperies, tapestries, and precious stones. The floor around the tomb of St. Peter was covered with gold and silver. These priceless treasures were stolen when the shrine was sacked by the Visigoths in 410, the Vandals in 455, the Saracens in 846, the Normans in 1084, and others who, attracted by their material value, totally ignored their spiritual significance. In fact, the countless pilgrims who traveled to Rome from all over the world were not interested in gold or silver. They only cared about videre petrum, seeing Peter, seeing the shrine, strengthening their faith and enriching their spirit. In order to help this constant flow of pilgrims, the Scole Peregrinorum sprang up around the old basilica, providing hostels and hospices for pilgrims of all nations, Frisians, Franks, Czechs, Teutons, Flemish, Hungarians, Illyrians, Saxons, Lombards, Armenians, and Abyssians. They came from Corsica and from the north of the Po River and every part of the world. Rome was becoming the patria communis, the opportunity as a pilgrim to live, eat, and sleep so close to the tomb of St. Peter, gatekeeper of heaven, for even a short time, was considered a step towards salvation. This network for pilgrims had to close down when work was begun on the new basilica. The only scolle that remained within the Vatican wall are the Teutonic Church and the Church of St. Stephen of Abyssinia. However, the glorious basilica where 23 emperors had been crowned, that had welcomed pilgrims from every part of the world, that had celebrated the first holy year of 1300, described by Dante and immortalized by Giotto's paintings, that had confirmed and strengthened Christian faith, began to show the ravages of time after 12 centuries. In the 16th century, after several attempts of restorations, the basilica with its enormous history and traditions was at risk. Reluctantly, the decision was made to demolish it, but on the brighter side, another decision was made to erect an even greater one, the basilica as it exists today on the same site. In 1506, Pope Julius II laid the first stone of the new basilica and started construction that was to last for 120 years. The greatest artists of the era worked on it, Bramante, Raphael, Michelangelo, Fontana, Della Porta, Bernini, Maderno, and many others. Faith and genius paid homage to Peter's tomb and the new basilica, with its enormous dome reaching skyward, continues its hymn of praise to the greatness of God and the honor of St. Peter. And so, in preparation for the coming of the infant Christ, we too come to the tomb of St. Peter today, which lies underneath this basilica. And within the church, with Peter and under Peter, we continue our Advent journey as the days darken, a darkening not only physical, as daylight diminishes, but also the darkness of our own lives, of those around us, of the world. A darkness which only allows for the light, for the light to shine brighter, for the luminance beyond our imagination. And we pray the collect for today's Mass. Lend your ear to our prayers, O Lord, we beseech you, and brighten the darkness of our minds by the grace of your coming who liveth and reigneth with God the Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, world without end. Amen. And yet today we already rejoice. As St. Paul tells us, Brethren, rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known to all men. The Lord is near. Have no anxiety. But in every prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your petitions be made known to God. And may the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Thank you for joining us today at Crux Stationalis. There is so much more to see of St. Peter's Basilica and other Roman station churches. Subscribe and like this video and share with your family and friends. And we'll see you at our next Roman station church.